Oh, man, I'm so happy to be with you guys tonight. Um, how many of you just enjoy listening to the scriptures, reading the word of God, hearing the voice of the spirit? How many of you enjoy that? Uh, I love to read a lot of old saints and uh, one of my favorite old saints, Burroughs, Jeremiah Burroughs. He says that uh, he talks he talks of the breathings of the spirit, the breathings of the spirit. Uh, the scripture tells us that all scripture is breathed by God. Uh, so we're going to receive the, we're going to intake the outbreath of God tonight. Uh, remember when Adam lay there lifeless and formless, how did God make him alive? Breath, the neshama, he, he breathed into his lifeless being and he came to life. I remember um, reading also from Charles Spurgeon, it's a quote I like to start with a lot. He said he was asked, what's more important, uh, worship or the word? And his response was, you tell me what's more important, uh, breathing in or breathing out. <laughs> uh, so we'll look a little bit at, at some things tonight. I'll pray in a second, but I just want to say thank you so much for, for honoring us and respecting what God has put upon us to do with our, our little lives that God has given to us. And I want to say, you know, thanks to, to John and Linda for just being kind to us, taking us in and speaking into us, prophesying to us. Each time we've been, you've prophesied to us and you've already spoken to us while we're here, but we're looking forward to getting more from you guys. Uh, like I told you earlier, this is when we come here, I feel like it's for us as well. Um, so it's a mutual exchange. We're really happy to be here. So thank you again for having us. Um, I want to talk to you tonight. I, I've waited on the Lord. How many of you know that David said, uh, he, he said, I wait for your word. You see those words you put together? I wait for your word. The word comes by waiting. But waiting pulls the word towards you. You want to hear the word of the voice of the Lord? You want to receive the word of God, which is life. Jesus tells us we don't live by bread alone, but by every word. You want that life word? It comes by waiting upon the Lord. And waiting upon the Lord is really precious and wonderful. We don't wait for his presence. We wait in his presence. And we just, we just linger there with no other agenda but him. And from that place, we receive the word. So I waited on the Lord and I really felt like I was going to go one direction, but I felt the Lord just kind of shift me to speak to you guys about something that you know so well and to encourage you in what you know so well and encourage you in what you're doing so well. Okay. Uh, there's something about encouragement. Encouragement is, uh, it's like styro, it's like styrofoam, you know, it's, it's, it's used and then it goes away. You need them, all, you need them constantly. You need encouragement constantly. So I want to encourage you again in what you already know. And I want to encourage you with the enjoyment of God. Uh, this is what I want to talk to you about. This is so important. The enjoyment of God and not just to enjoy God once, but to live inside of and by the enjoyment of God. I want to talk to you about how important it is. Three specific things. I want to talk to you about what it is. I want to talk to you about what it does. And I want to talk to you about how we do it. And again, I know you guys understand these things. But by way of encouragement, may the spirit breathings come. And may these things that you know come alive. And may there be more vitality, more life in these things after tonight because of the the presence of the Spirit. So, Father, I thank you for the Holy Ghost. And I just ask you, precious God, for spirit breathings. Breathe upon our embers, Lord. Make them burn bright. God, I pray for that kind of enjoyment of you that Jesus bled to give to us. Oh, Lord, help us see tonight that if we don't enjoy you, then we miss what the blood was for. <laughs> Oh, because the reconciliation is the restoration of God and man finding their pleasure in one another. Lord, help us see tonight that holiness is the fruit of being addicted to the maximum pleasure of life. God himself, in your precious name, make this real to us, God. In your holy name, amen. So speaking of the enjoyment of God, I'm going to run through a bunch of scriptures. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to follow along. We're going to look at a lot of scripture if that's all right. But a couple of things, I remember Dr. Brown used to say to us in Bible college, he'd say, um, I apologize for quoting so much scripture while preaching the word. <laughs> 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 uh, 
But talking of the enjoyment of God, there's a quote from A.W. Tozer that goes, God made us for himself that we might know him, live with him, and enjoy him forever. Very simple. God made us. I'm saying he made you. You were created, fashioned, formed for this reason, that you might know him, that you might live with him, and that you might enjoy him. And this is so important because as Jesse Penn Lewis wrote a long time ago, however full and blessed the past experiences may have been, their power depend upon a fresh inflow of divine life. How many of you know that to be true? Uh, you, you've had an incredible experience with God, and it's, it's something that marks you, and it's special. But in time, the power of that old encounter is dependent upon a fresh inflow from that same life. In other words, God has to continually keep you. And it's not just that he sends you on your way with an experience. He wants you to live inside of experiencing him. Consistent enjoyment of him. Enjoyment is, enjoyment is the purest form of seeking God. Enjoyment meaning the coming to him for that blissful life exchange that he died to give to us. That's the purest form of seeking God. You're not seeking him for things. You're seeking him for him. This is so important. We live by him through enjoying him. We live by him through enjoying him. I would venture to say that where our enjoyment is lacking, the life and flow of God is lacking. It, when, when, when we stop enjoying God, you know by this your spiritual life is suffering. You, how do you know you're making progress in God? Your enjoyment is increasing and increasing and increasing. When the enjoyment of God begins to suffer, as I said, your spiritual life is suffering. You can gauge where you're at in your relationship with God by how much you enjoy Him. It's so important for us because we want this fresh inflow of divine life upon which even our old experiences depend, as Jesse Penn Lewis said. And I believe that ministry itself is an expression of our enjoyment of the Lord. If ministry is anything other than an expression of our enjoyment of the Lord, we miss what ministry actually is. It, ministry is really just the overflow that comes from an, uh, a, ministry actually is an outflow that comes from an overflow that came from an inflow. You're, you're enjoying, that's the inflow is enjoyment, and then that enjoyment begins to overflow, and then it outflows to other people. Therefore, ministry is the expression of your enjoyment of God. So let's look at our first scripture before I quote some more things here. The first scripture I want to look at is, look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. You guys have read this many times. But there's something that I want to point at in the new covenant that Paul is trying to show us the new covenant um, life and light that's there. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Let's just stop there for a second and look at 4.4. Same book. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, now this word rejoice, I'm pulling it because it has everything to do with enjoyment. Because rejoice inside of that word, what that word actually means is to take joy out of. So when you rejoice in the Lord, you're pulling joy out of the person of the Lord. And we know that as C.S. Lewis said, God doesn't give joy. He is joy. When you pull joy out of the person, you're receiving the person of Christ as your joy. And so rejoice in the Lord is Paul saying, take Christ as your joy. Enjoy Christ. This is what he's saying. And then he says it twice. He's, he says, rejoice in the, in the Lord all the time. Always. You notice that this is a command. It doesn't say, hey guys, rejoice in the Lord six days out of the week. He says, rejoice, take joy, take Christ as your joy all the time, always in everything. And then it says, rejoice on top of that. Again, I will say it, rejoice, take joy, take Christ as your joy. 
You say, Eric, but you're talking about the enjoyment of God. Exactly. (laughs) Rejoice in the Lord is enjoying God. It's enjoying the person of the Lord himself. Let's look over real quick at some Old Testament um, examples of the enjoyment of the Lord. We know that the Old Testament is wonderful, but it is uh, giving us shadows of the new covenant. We can, as I think it was old St. Augustine who said, the Old Testament is unfolded in the new and the New Testament is enfolded in the old. So you begin to see things by looking through the old covenant of foreshadowed realities that were manifested by the blood of Jesus Christ and broken open by the cross. Does that make sense? So you look at Psalm chapter 1. We're going to go through a bunch of scriptures. Here we go. The scripture says here, How blessed is the man How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight, his delight is in the law of the Lord. You say, Eric, but you're talking about enjoying the Lord. And this says the law of the Lord. Well, to David, you can't separate them. There isn't a scalpel thin enough to separate his God and God's law. He actually calls it the law of your mouth. In other words, it came from those lips that I love. That's why he loves the law. He doesn't love ink on pages. He loves the fact that it issued out of the lips of the one that he loves. When he says, your law, the law of your mouth is more precious to me than a thousand gold and silver pieces. It's not the letters on the page that he's talking about. It's the revelation of the character and nature that God has given of himself to men. My goodness, he says here, I delight, I delight in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Look at this. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. You say, Eric, what's the point? The point is that what enjoying God does in you and in me is it makes us fruitful in every season. We become evergreens. We're even in the midst of, I don't know if you saw during COVID, a lot of people fell off. But during COVID, some people thrived. The difference is whose delight was where? If the delight is in the Lord, you're always green. You know, we're always wanting revival, and I love revival. I grew up in revival, but an individual can live revived. How? By evergreen. How? Delighting in Him. And so this delight in the Lord, this delight in the Lord makes you evergreen, and God touches everything according to your life. Are you saying, Eric, that there's going to be no trials or tribulations? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that they don't, they don't affect your greenness. Is what I'm saying. (laughs) The winds blow, the snow comes, but you're still green. Why? Because you delight in God. It's because you're enjoying Him. Does that make sense to you? So what what is the enjoyment of the Lord? It's He's enjoying God's revelation of Himself. That's what it is. What it what it does, it makes him evergreen. How do you do it? He says right there, I meditate day and night in your law. He keeps the, the law in his heart. It's going over and on his bed. He even likes to say, on my bed, I meditate upon you. He's just constantly chewing the Lord, chewing on the Lord's goodness, remembering what he does, seeing him in everything. And this right there is how he just kind of fosters that enjoyment of God. How many of you have lived a day and just the the whirlwind of the day stopped you from being aware of the Lord and that day, no matter how good the day was, it was terrible. And then how many of you had a really bad day, but you were aware of the Lord and it was a wonderful day? (laughs) Isn't it funny how the Lord can do this? Because he's showing us something that joy doesn't come from circumstances. Joy comes from receiving God. As, as Witness Lee wrote many years ago, he said that prayer is inhaling God. <laughs> Just living in prayer, you know. I, I read this quote the other day, blew my mind. I actually shut the book and walked away. It was so powerful. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon said, prayer is to feel one's body made the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to say it one more time. That's worth memorizing. Prayer is to feel one's body made the temple of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. And so this, this delight in the Lord, this is what he's doing, he's delighting. Look over at Psalm 36, verse 8. This one, I write, I write this when I sign um, the books that we've written, which are out there. I'd love to write this scripture in there. 
Psalm 36, <clears throat> verse 8. Actually, let's look up a little bit higher at 7. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. The children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They drink their fill. They drink their fill. (laughs) That's incredible. They don't just get a sip. They can drink until they can't drink anymore. They drink their fill from the abundance of your house. You give them to drink of the river of your delights. For with you is a fountain of life. And in your light we see light. You say, Eric, what are you pointing at here? I'm pointing at delight. (laughs) And why? Because delight gives light to your eyes. You're you're illuminated. You see things rightly. You see things clearly. I remember the old quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, I believe in the sun, not just because I can see it, but by it I see. And so it is with delighting in the Lord. We delight in God and our eyes open and we see rightly and we're filled up. We become those that drink of this river called the river of his delights. I mean, think about the river of his delights. What in the world is this? Think about it as a flow of life coming forth from himself. You know, in Revelation, it says that there's a river that flows from underneath the throne of God, which is symbolic of his rule. Underneath his rule flows a river of life. And in Ezekiel, we have the same picture of a river that everything it touches, it comes alive. You think of a gray world and everything, that the, everywhere this river runs, it just gets all its color back again. The animals come back to life and everything. This is the river of life flowing. And so we see here this river of life. And the scriptures tell us in Psalm 16 that at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So this, this pleasurable river is God himself giving you himself. As I said earlier, this is God's restoration of enjoyment of one another, pleasure in one another. It's the gospel. (laughs) Jesus has opened up a new and living way. For what reason? That you might enjoy God again. What did Adam lose in the garden? His identity? Yeah, sure. But more than that, his enjoyment of God. This is what Jesus has come back to give to you. The enjoyment of God. Uh, Look over at Psalm 37, verse 4. We'll try to keep them in, in order here. But look at this, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, I've read many different translations of this and the best way, and you can look this up yourself and test this to be true, but the best way to understand what's being said here is that if you delight in the Lord, you get the desire of your heart, which is the one you delight in. (laughs) You're receiving God. As you delight in God, you get God. (laughs) The, the, the reward of worship is God, as our friend William McDowell says. So Psalm 37, 4. Look over at Psalm 40, verse 8. Look at this one. No, no, let's pass Psalm 40, verse 8. Let's go to 94, 19. This one's incredible. 94, 19. Is this okay? Yeah. 94, 19. Look at this. When, when, when. Doesn't say if, doesn't say that, that slim chance. It says when. In other words, this is going to happen at some point. When my anxious thoughts multiply within me. How many of you have had that feeling before? Have you ever had anxiety just hit you when you're just standing there? You don't even know where it came from. Have you ever been sitting on your bed at night thinking and you're thinking yourself into an absolute abyss? Of things that you, have you ever done this? When this happens, when it comes upon you or when you dig the hole for yourself, you can know this, that his consolations delight your soul. In other words, this is the way out. Delighting in God. How? By his consolations. You say, what's consolations? It is comfort that comes from a person. That's what the word consolation means. Comfort that comes from a person. So anxiety hits you. Your mind begins to go crazy. You go to the person and delighted, the delightful one. And as you delight in him, that's how he takes care of those things. In other words, David is drawing a line in the sand. And he's putting one thing on one side and another thing on the other. And he's saying anxiety is the opposite of enjoyment. And he's saying enjoyment will destroy anxiety. And anxiety will destroy enjoyment. So go to enjoyment when you feel anxiety because it will destroy it. It's mutually exclusive. Does that make sense? All right, let's go to another. Let's look at Psalm 119.92. Again, I'm talking to you about the enjoyment of God. Because this is what Jesus died for. 
Look at this. Psalm 119, 92. If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. Do you see this? Delighting in God will protect you when you come underneath affliction. Which means if you don't live a life that enjoys and delights in God, affliction will probably crush you. Affliction becomes heavy and destroys those people that don't delight in God. But those that delight in God, though they do come under affliction, the Lord delivers them out of them all. The Lord comes in and lifts you up and carries you. And sometimes the Lord doesn't even remove the affliction. He makes it irrelevant. How many of you had this before? Praise God. Don't you, don't you see even tonight like the word of God is encouraging us to take great delight in God? Praise God. This makes me really happy. Let's look over at Proverbs 23. Look at this one. Again, what I'm talking to you about is what it is to enjoy the Lord, what it does to you, and how you do it. Proverbs 23, verse 26. Look at this. Give me your heart, my son, and let your eyes delight in my ways. I want you to notice two things in this verse. The giving of your heart and delighting in his ways. Notice that the giving of the heart is the way to the delighting in his ways. The giving of your heart is first. The delighting is second. In other words, when you say, Lord, here's my heart, that's the way into the delight of God's ways, the delight of God himself. In other words, delight is a heart issue. <laughs> delight is where, who has your heart? Now you say, Eric, what's the point of even making that? Why would you even say that? Because what, something else has your heart, you can't delight in God. Whatever you give your heart, Jesus says it like this, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. If Christ, is Christ your treasure? Then he holds your heart. You know, but if Christ be not your treasure, then he holds not your heart. And as Madame Guyon wrote in her perfect book, uh, uh, what is it? Short and easy method of prayer. She said, if God has the heart, he has the man. <laughs> Because that's what he wants. You remember what God says in the Old Testament, what he wants, first of all, from his people, to love the Lord your God with all your heart. With all your heart. He's after the heart. He wants the heart. He desires the heart. The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro. He's looking around the whole entire world, looking for a heart that is completely his. My son, give me your heart and delight in my ways. Give the heart to the Lord, and we enter into the delight of the Lord. Let's look at Song of Solomon real quick. We can't talk about this kind of thing without looking at Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon chapter 2, just look at this real quick. Remember, I'm talking to you about what it is to delight in the Lord, what it does to you, and how you do it. Chapter 2, verse 3. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. This is the bride talking of the bridegroom. And she's saying he's so different than everybody else. He's like a tree that bears forth fruit while everybody else is just a tree of the forest. He's someone that gives me nourishment while nobody else can give me nourishment. My apple tree is my bridegroom, she's saying. And look what she says she does here. She says, so in his shade, I took great delight. I took great delight. And I sat down and his fruit was sweet to my taste. You see what's happening here? She's resting in the divine shadow. And she is enjoying and tasting of him. Do you see this? Delighting in the Lord is connected to the recognition of him as bridegroom. And that he's the only one that can nourish your soul. It is coming close to him. Getting underneath his shadow. It is drawing near so that you can hear. Happiness, as, as Thomas Watson wrote, heaven is in the soul that draws near to God. Heaven is in the soul that draws near to God. I want to encourage you tonight so that when you leave here tonight, you're just even more happy and inspired and desiring to run away and be with the Lord in some way. And to live a life that just enjoys this above all other things because there isn't anything greater than this. There's a, there's a quote by Evagrius Pontus, an old Christian writer. He said, can you imagine... Listen to these words. He says, can you imagine any greater thing than to fellowship with God himself and be absorbed by him? Listen to those words. That's incredible. 
In other words, he's trying to call your attention to realize you can't find anything else to do that is more delightful and glorious than this right here. Enjoying the Lord. So we see the bride enjoys the bridegroom. Look, look over at, at Isaiah 58. Let's, let's look at a couple more. Is that okay? Is this too much for you? Yeah. Isaiah 58. This one kind of blows my mind and makes me feel like rushes of electricity when I read this one. Uh, if I read this and I believe this, it really makes me just, I don't know, sh- shake with happiness. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 58. Look at verse 14. No, actually, let's look at 13. I want to point at how you get to the delight. He says, if because of the Sabbath you turn your foot. All right, now let's jump down halfway through. From seeking your own pleasure. From seeking your own pleasure. If you turn your foot from seeking your own pleasure. Do you see that? If you turn your foot from seeking your own pleasure, then, verse 14, then, when? If you turn your foot from seeking your own pleasure, then, at that time, you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You say, Eric, what do you say? Doesn't that make you feel cra- like, like... <laughs> Guys, the mouth of the Lord has spoken that if you turn from your own desires, if you turn from your own desires and you turn towards him, then he will make you delight in him. And in delighting in him, look at this. He's going to take you up to the highest places of the earth and he's going to throw you so that you just make progress rapidly fast. Acceleration. Acceleration. Isn't that insane? Who doesn't want that life? I want that life and I'm not interested in anything else. And I feel, I, I feel grieved when, my, when my, my mind thinks of anything other than this. Wants anything other than this. Like, Lord, get that out of me. Help me to love your, your law. Help me to love your presence. Then you will take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth or the high places of the earth. Let's look at a couple more. Is that okay? Look at Jeremiah chapter 15. Again, I'm talking to you about what it is to enjoy the Lord, what it does to you, and how you do it. You're seeing it in all these, right? Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. <laughs> look at this one. This is crazy. Your words were found and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and a delight, the delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name, O Lord of hosts. But I want to draw attention to right there. In his eating of the words of the Lord, he found that pleasure, that delight, that enjoyment that we're talking about. How do you do it? What is it? It's the enjoyment of the person of the Lord. What does it do? Well, it causes you to have great joy. How do you do it? By eating his words. Eating his words. Remember, we just talked about in Song of Solomon. She eats the apples. There's something about ed- ed- God making himself edible for us. And Jesus looks down and he says, it's like the Father, the Son, and the Spirit were all around each other. And they're talking about the plan of the ages. And Jesus says, you know, at that point, before we make man, but before we even make man, I, I know that the whole idea here is that I'm going to become one of them. Because remember, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, which means Jesus is not plan B. <laughs> he was always plan A to reveal God the Father and his goodness and his mercy. So the whole thing, before man's even created, Jesus is like, okay, they're going to need a way to understand what I am for them. Therefore, when we make man, let's install inside of them a principle called food for life. In other words, they have to eat in order to live. And then when I show up as one of them, I can really communicate a lot to them by standing in front of them and saying, I am food for you. Now they'll understand what I am for them. You say, Eric, when did Jesus say I am food for you? He says, I am the bread of life that comes down from heaven. (laughs) And the, the wonderful thing about John 6 is it doesn't say he just came down. It says he comes down. There's a perpetual coming of the Lord. In other words, he continually feeds you with himself. Madame Guyon said, oh, great shepherd who feedeth thy flock with thyself. Oh, Jesus. 
So we have this, our, his words came and we ate them. All right, let's go, let's go down on a binge real quick and look at the Psalms real quick. Psalm 4, I'm just going to do a few more, okay, and then we'll be done. Psalm 4, verse 7. <laughs> I forget who I'm with. Psalm 4, guys, this is incredible. Psalm 4, verse 7. Ah. <clears throat> the scripture says here, you have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and their new wine abound. At the beginning of this, in, in verse 6, it says, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart. You say, Eric, you're talking about rejoicing. You're talking about enjoyment. You're talking about joy. You're talking about delight. But this says gladness. Yes, if you look, they all have the same root. <laughs> They're all the same thing. Taking gladness in the Lord. Taking a, a delight in the Lord. Rejoicing in the Lord. Joy in the Lord. They're all the same thing. And when you look at this, you see that that gladness, that rejoicing, that enjoyment comes from the light of His countenance. It's living in the light. The scriptures tell us that if you walk in the light as he is in the light, that's the light of his countenance. It's like saying no to the shadows and exposing everything to the Lord. Walking in the light doesn't mean living perfect. Walking in the light means hiding nothing from the Lord. It doesn't mean, hey, in order for me to become like Jesus, or let's say it like this, in order for me to have the presence of God in my life, I've got to be like Jesus. That's completely wrong. That's what the devil wants you to believe. It should be understood as this. I got to experience the presence of the Lord so that I can become like Jesus. And so God does this by the light of his countenance. He puts that enjoyment in your heart. The wonderful thing I think that the enjoyment does in my life is it literally satisfies the soul so deeply. I don't want anything else. How many of you have noticed that? Like when you experience the presence of the Lord, you just... You find that nothing else really matters. Uh, sometimes when we, we want the results of enjoying God so bad, we forget to just enjoy God. <laughs> but when we, when we enjoy God... We accomplish more on accident than we ever did on purpose. When we enjoy God, for instance, like this, a, ma- a woman may be saying, oh, Lord, help me with my patience, or I'm working on my patience. The reality is, is this, is that patience isn't something that you work to get. Patience is a fruit of enjoyment. So rather than praying, Lord, please help me with my patience, just go deeper into the enjoyment and he'll be patience through you. Say, Eric, could it be? Yes, that's why he uses the word fruit to destroy works because works can never produce fruit. So the word fruit is used to show that it's an effortless result of communion and the receiving of enjoyment. You say, Eric, where is this word fruit that you're talking about? Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. It's not even your fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God, such things, uh, there is no law. So knowing God really is just enjoying Him. Enjoying Him is the essence of knowing God. You think about what Jesus tells us about fruit. He tells us that we need fruit for glorifying God. Or He says that this is what glorifies God. That you bear forth much fruit. How many of you want to glorify God? Well, to glorify God, you need something called fruit. Right? (laughs) Now, Just basic understanding of fruit is this, is that if glorifying God means that you need fruit, fruit means that you need life. (laughs) Have you ever seen a dead tree bear forth fruit? It can't. It's life that causes the limb to produce. So in order to have fruit, you need life. And in order for you to have life, you need enjoyment. As you enjoy the Lord, you receive the life of God. As you receive the life of God, you bear forth fruit. And as you bear forth fruit, you glorify God. Does that make sense? So activity will always produce results, but it's enjoyment that produces fruit. There's a difference between results and fruit, if you will. 
You can make stuff happen. Scripture even says, well, uh, uh, in all labor there is profit. So you can just do a bunch of things, or you can enjoy and become something. Jesus is far more interested in making us something than getting us to do stuff. Otherwise, he would have just made us a bunch of elves. <laughs> he's not looking for elves. He's looking for conduits. He wants to flow through. We always say, oh, Lord of the harvest, send forth labors. But his definition of labors is different than ours. Our definition is anybody that will do the work. His definition is those through whom I can work. So striving, striving is the curse. Enjoyment is the covenant. And when we understand this enjoyment, then we see that the essential Christian message is not do, but delight. We enjoy the unsatisfied life I, I, on, the, on the other side of things. The unsatisfied life is an idle factory. When the heart is not satisfied, it creates all kinds of things to latch on to. And I find that this is so true. The unsatisfied life is an idle factory. That is so true. Just as much as haste only leads to waste. And just as much as uh, rush is always wrong. <laughs> Just as much as to hurry God is to find fault with him, as Walter Butler said. To hurry God is to find fault with him. These, all these things are in one category. Impatience is disinterest in the dove. Impatience is, is, is I, would, I would say it like this. The greatest idol sculptures in the entire world are those people who won't wait on God. <laughs> You say, Eric, where are you getting this from? Remember when Moses was gone too long? And they wanted to replace Yahweh? So they made some gold image and they named it Yahweh? <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's so ridiculous, but that's how insane not waiting on God is. That is insanity acting out by not valuing God. The most insane thing a man can do is not value God. And not value God enough to wait on Him. As I said, impatience is disinterest in the dove. Impatience is an idol factory. Impatience is sculpting idols and then slapping God's name on them. You say, Eric, why are you, why are you talking now about impatience? Well, we won't wait because we don't have enjoyment. Enjoying God enables you to wait for him. If you don't enjoy God, you won't wait for him. But if you enjoy God, if you lose your delight in him, you will begin to look to replace him quickly. Are you following me? You will try to replace him. See, delight isn't a side issue. Delight is the very means by which he frees you and empowers you to be able to obey him. Delight isn't just a perk. Delight is what this whole thing is about. Bring man and God back into love fellowship and enjoyment with one another. Are you following me? Yeah. So um, many people don't enjoy God, I find, because they're still bound to something they want from Him. In other words, they're like, all they can think of when they get with God is what they want Him to do. But they don't realize that that very thing they're holding on to is keeping them from ascending up into enjoyment with Him. But if they'll just let go of everything and say, Lord, only you, you're all I desire, literally the Spirit will begin to lift them up and they'll go up into the blissful enjoyment. And they'll ride in the high places. As we talked about earlier, the, the high places free you from all the lower things. As Charles Cowman wrote, the, the eagle that soars in the heights doesn't worry about how he's going to cross a river. <laughs> See... I think that the Adamic, the Adamic, you know what I mean by Adamic, that thing which comes through Adam. The Adamic plague is that the tree of life isn't enough. But the enjoyment of God is to say your tree is more than this tree. The enjoyment of God is you are my tree of life. The, the scripture says that the tree of life is a desire fulfilled. In other words, it's coming to Christ to be the fulfillment of all your desire. That's the tree of life. Christ is our tree of life. So, um, spiritual maturity, in my opinion, is when enjoying the Lord is taking place before or even without the answer to your prayers. Right. You say, Eric, but what does that even mean? Does that mean that God doesn't answer prayer? No, that's not what I'm saying. Don't hear that. 
But hear this, that when we enjoy the Lord, we find everything we ever needed in him so that whether or not he ever does what we ask for, it doesn't change us. It doesn't take away our, our, our joy. Does that make sense to you? Um, can I just do a couple more scriptures before we're done? Is that all right? Just because uh, these, these things are so great. Look at, look at Psalm 511. As a matter of fact, are you pulling them up there? Maybe I can just... Yeah. Um, Psalm 511. Look at this one. But rejoice. There it is. All you who take refuge in the Lord, sing for joy forever. And may you shelter them that those who love your name may rejoice in you. You see, taking joy out of the person of the Lord is also connected to refuge in the Lord. I was reading this book recently by Thomas Watson. And he's talking about how God is the saint's spiritual delight. And then he says, how delightful is a man who's famished how, how delighted is a man who's famished when he finds food? They says, so you should find great delight in Christ who is bread for you. And then he says, how delighted is a man who's been in the desert and he finds refuge. He finds a shadow. Oh, how Christ is a great shadow for you. How delighted is a woman when she finds a man that will love her and take care of her. Well, Christ is a bridegroom for you. Yeah. And then he says, how the famished man who doesn't have a drink, he's offered some water. How delighted is he to take that water? Christ is water for you. How delighted is a friend when he's in sorrow and then his friend comes and is there for him. Christ is a better friend than any friend that comes to you. There's no consolation like Christ himself. So finding in him all, all these delights. Look at Psalm 9 too. Look at this one. This one is crazy. Psalm 9, 2. <laughs> I will rejoice and be jubilant in you. I will sing praises to your name. Oh God, look at the connection between praise and taking joy out of God. Rejoicing. In other words, when you begin to take joy from the Lord. In other words, you go to the Lord to be your joy. Praise is the inevitable result. Yeah. I once heard a message by John Piper, and he said this. He said, to the degree our praise is without feeling, we diminish the one that we praise. Think about what he's saying here. In other words, he's trying to encourage you to leave feelingless praise. Praise that is only mouth. Praise, as Jesus says, they praise me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. They don't feel what they're saying, Jesus says. This is hypocrisy at its finest. You don't even feel what you're saying. That's why it sounds hollow and it rings in a way that's repulsive. Does that make sense? Jesus is saying, you feel it. Piper's saying, to the degree that our praise is without feeling, we're diminishing him who we praise. And now you say, what does that even mean? Well, I can... Put that together with something that I love from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis talks about having a cup of tea. And he says, when you take that tea and you put it in your mouth and it bursts on your tongue, you swallow it down, it's nice and warm, it's your favorite tea, and you go like this, you say, oh, that's good tea. As C.S. Lewis is saying that this is an experience he has as an Englishman. And then he says, that is a picture of praise. Because praise is the commencement of enjoyment. So praise is literally, you taste that tea. Oh, I love this tea. You just praise what you're enjoying. Praise is the commencement of enjoyment. So to the degree your praise is without feeling, you're diminishing the one that you praise. If you enjoy him, you say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise begins to just happen to you. You begin to see that praise isn't something you do as much as it is something that happens when you taste and you see that the Lord is good. And you receive and you, you feel, you, re, you realize this enjoyment with God. These people that enjoy God, you who enjoy God, live lives of praise. And you're not even trying to. It's happening because you're enjoying Him. Does that make sense? This is why the devil wants to stab your enjoyment. Because he wants to take your praise he wants to take that out of you. He wants to take your worship from you. He wants to take your eternal perspective. He wants to take away from you that, uh, that wonderful enjoyment of God. Let's look at another one. 21.6. Psalm 21.6, yeah. I promise there's just a couple more, but 
They're, they're really good. For you make him most blessed forever. You make him joyful with the joy of your presence. Are you seeing the connection between the presence of the Lord and the enjoyment of the Lord? We see this many times in scriptures, but this is a good one to look at for that. The presence of the Lord is where God makes you joyful. Sometimes we're trying to make ourselves joyful, but you can't make yourself joyful without God. It's God that makes the heart joyful, right? And look at uh, Psalm 40, verse 16. 40, verse 16. May all who seek you, look at the words here, seek you, rejoice and be glad in you. Do you see that seeking the Lord and the enjoyment of the Lord are merged together? Those that seek him actually enjoy him. Those that enjoy him are those that seek him. Actually, you can say that enjoyment is the highest form of seeking God. It is the highest form of seeking God. Let's look at 64.10. I love doing this. Is this okay? I really just love staring at the scriptures. 64.10. The righteous person, look at this, the righteous person will be glad in the Lord and take refuge in him and all the upright in heart will boast. But I want to point out two things here. Look at where the glad in the Lord comes from. The enjoyment of God comes from what? Righteous person. So this does not mean that you have to live perfectly in order to enjoy the Lord. It's when righteousness is imputed to you, you have Christ's ability to enjoy God. As Charles Spurgeon said, you stand before God as Christ because Christ stood before God as you. Uh, You know, you have a great need for Christ, but you have a great Christ for your need. And so the more that you receive that, uh, the more that you believe that imputed righteousness, that is your perfect passage into unfailing delight in the Lord. Uh, And I'll tell you this. When you are under condemnation, which means you, you're having trouble believing the imputed righteousness that is yours, that Christ has given you his own standing before God. When you have trouble believing that, maybe because of a failure, you, you, it's hard for you to, to recognize that you're as perfect as Christ in God's eyes. That will rob your ability to rejoice and delight and enjoy the Lord. So that's why the devil loves to condemn you. That's why he's called the accuser of the brethren. Why? What's he after? He don't want you to enjoy God. Why? Because enjoyment of God comes through imputed righteousness from Christ. He opened up the new and living way. You don't, you don't have a right to enjoy God by your own works. You can't. It's just not. No one is better than Jesus. The only person that has a right to claim access to God because they fasted enough is somebody who's more righteous than Jesus. Anybody want to claim that? (laughs) There's only one way and only one reason why God has a wonderful, unbroken, all-in access for you, and it is because of someone else. Another, capital A, Christ, who has granted it to you. Praise God. That's freeing, isn't it? Therefore, let me just say, let me just speak plainly. When you make a mistake, you fail. This should not stop you in any way from going straight to Christ. Why? Because if you think it's about you, then you better stay away. But if it's not about you, you can walk right in and say, Lord, please wash me. I need you. I need you. This is the the reality that I need you in my life. Praise God. Look at Psalm 70 verse 4. Oh, is that the same one? I apologize. 90 verse 15. There's just four more. Is that okay? Just four more. (laughs) We didn't? Okay. Psalm 70 verse 4. You got that one? Oh, wait. That's up there, right? Okay. Do Psalm 90 verse 15. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us. Oh, look at 14, just before that, because that's a great part. That's a great second part. Satisfy us 
in the morning with your graciousness or your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and rejoice all of our days. I want to point out two things here. Rejoice all our days. It doesn't say rejoice most of our days. Have joy in the midst of our days. Rejoice all our days. In other words, you have enjoyment to be able to be experienced all the time. And look at what it's connected to. Being satisfied with God. Satisfy us in the morning. When Christ is looked to to be our satisfaction, which is this, you realize your insufficiency and you recognize his all sufficiency. That's the key to coming in to the great enjoyment that is for you. Does that make sense? I, I love it. Satisfaction and the enjoyment of God are married together. Are married together. Look at Psalm 97, 12. Psalm 97, 12. Be joyful in the Lord, you his righteous ones, or you righteous ones, and praise the mention of his holy name. Two things I want to connect here. Look at the righteousness and the being joyful. That joy is yours, not because of your righteousness, but because of his. There is never a reason for Christians to be sad. Because we have a righteousness that comes from heaven. The day that you feel really bad and you don't feel happy, say this to yourself. None of my sins are counted against me. Praise God. I am perfectly accepted before God because of what Jesus Christ has done. All right, look at Psalm 104, 34, and then there's one after that and we're done. Psalm 104, 34. May my praise be pleasing to him. As for me, I shall rejoice in the Lord. Notice the marrying together of praise and taking joy out of the Lord. Joy in the Lord and praise. Again, married. Last verse. Psalm 126, verse 3. There's so many more, but, you know, we we don't have time. The Lord has done great things for us. We are joyful. This is a key to experiencing the enjoyment of the Lord all the time. Look at what he's doing. He's remembering what God has done. And this helps him enter into the enjoyment of God. The joy that is in Christ. How? Remembering what God has done. Sometimes I personally just sit down and I recount the times God has covered me. God has picked me up. God has forgiven me. God has healed somebody that I know. God has protected us. God has provided for us. I think of the things that the Lord has done consistently in our lives. And then I go to the scriptures. I remember his faithfulness to Daniel and the lion's den. I remember how he is faithful to David. I think about his faithfulness to Abraham. I start thinking about how he's proved himself in the scriptures to be this incredibly faithful person. And in that, I find joy start rising up. And then when I really want to get to it, I think of the cross. And I think of what he did at Calvary. And I think of how that removes everything from me. And that he has sent his Holy Spirit into my heart. That he's coming back again. I think of all these things that he's done. And that causes joy to start rising up. I promise you this. That depression makes its way into our lives to the degree we forget what God has done. There's a, there's a story of an old woman, she's on her deathbed, and her son who knew she believed in God, didn't believe in God, and he comes to her and he says this, he says, what is this gospel that you believe and how do you believe it? And the old woman says, the gospel that I believe is this, that God is satisfied with his son, and how I believe it is this, I'm satisfied with him too. <laughs> this is the essence of where everything meets together. In Christ, we have God. In Christ, we've been reconciled into an enjoyment together with God. There's a story also of a man who is given perfect access, complete access to a vault of treasures. 
And when he comes out, I mean, he's so baffled by all the gold and the silver. He looks down on the ground and he comes back out. And as he, they say, go back in and take whatever you want. He goes back in. He's just mesmerized by all the, by all the treasure. And then he comes back out again. And when he goes to see his friends, he says, guys, I saw all this gold. And they said, what'd you get? And he thinks to himself, oh man, I, I didn't, I didn't get anything. And they look at him and they say, whose fault is it that you're poor? In other words, Christ has opened the vault of his person to you. And it's easy just to know and see and think of these things and never actually grab a hold of them and come out with the riches that he is for us. Whose fault is it that we are poor if we do not enjoy what he has opened for us? You say, Eric, what does that look like? Whose fault is it if we don't have joy, if we don't have peace, if we don't have satisfaction in him? Whose fault is it? When he has granted to us full access to himself. I'll close out with this little quote that I believe is to be, to be seen as the, the very key for enjoying God every day. This is written by Martha Kilpatrick. She says, need, need, the need of God. Need is the great gift of God. She says, while he lets us choose our independence of him in Eden, he did not release us from needing him. And that necessity for him is the very route back to him. Isn't that incredible? Then she goes on and she says, need is the screaming crisis of our core. The abject groveling need of God and nothing No attainment, no person will fill that groaning cavity. What she's saying is this, that everybody has this ability to connect directly with God inside of them. And it's called the recognition of your need. I need you. I don't have what you are and I need you. And that's the way in. And the only people that cannot enter in are those that think they don't need anything. That's why it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Daniel Kalenda used to say at conferences when we do them together, he'd say, the only person who's going to go home empty are those who are full of themselves. (laughs) Let's pray on that note. Father, thank you so much for the gospel, the gospel, the gospel that grants to us perfect access to God, the receiving of the spirit, the enjoyment of your presence. Lord, I just ask you, that you would quicken each one of our understanding of what it means to live a Christian life, that being the enjoyment of you above all things, God. Let us, like that old woman say, the gospel is God is satisfied with his son, and my believing it is that I am satisfied with him too. In your precious name, amen.